presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Whistler will continue in just a moment. And now, the Whistler Strange Story, Christmas Bonus. With most human beings, the line between good and evil is a thin and waving one. And very often, the impulse for good will outweigh and nullify the bad. Such was the case with Michael Cobb. Mike wasn't really bad at all. It happened while he was a kid. He'd gotten into trouble, gone to prison, served a stretch. And now you're out, aren't you, Mike? And you've learned your lesson. You're proving that by going straight. You're working hard at your job in a department store. You're married to the girl you love, aren't you, Mike? And you're happy. Mm, delicious. <laughs> delicious. Nobody can cook a better breakfast than you, darling. Thank you, sir. Mm. Oh, now, Mike, don't bowl your coffee. No, I've got to run. <clears throat> be late. Oh, now, a couple of minutes won't make any difference. Well, no, maybe not most days, but today's going to be a big one. It's just a few shopping days before Christmas, mm -hmm. you know. The store's going to be jammed. We'll be swamped with work until late tonight. Besides, I don't want to spoil my record. Six months and I haven't been late to work once. I know, and it's fine. And I'm sure the store appreciates it, but... You know, Helena, I think they do. I, I, I really think they like me down there. I like my work, everything. Why, sure, Mike. How could they help liking you? No, I mean... Well, I'm, I'm beginning to feel like... Well, that, that other thing's all forgotten. Almost like something that never happened. It is. It is forgotten, Mike. Everything's different now. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> It's going to be a lot different Christmas than the last one, isn't it? Yes, Mike. Oh, you are wonderful, Elaine. Coming to see me, sticking by me. Darling, I promise you there'll never be another Christmas like that. Never. Now, I know they won't, Mike. From now on, they're all going to be really Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you bet. You know, that reminds me, I haven't got you present yet. I'll, I'll try to run out my lunch hour and find something. Oh, now, Mike, you're not going to go spending a lot of money on me. Maybe next year we'll be more on our feet then. Oh, never you mind. I'll get you what I darn please. Gosh, now I will be late if I don't. Oh, here's your hat. Thanks. Goodbye, darling. If I don't get home before midnight, don't worry. All right, I won't. Yes, it does look like a Merry Christmas is in store for you, doesn't it, Mike? For the first time in your life, almost. A real Merry Christmas. As you walk down the street, listening to the Christmas carols, emanating from the radios on display in music store lobbies, and view the smiles on people's faces as they hurry along the street, you get a sort of kick out of the stores. And then you're at your own place of employment. You feel an atmosphere of happiness there. The evergreen smells good in the elevator, too, doesn't it? And you chuckle as you pass the toy department with a perspiring Santa Claus pulling on his red coat. Yes, Mike. You're getting the Christmas spirit, aren't you? Morning, George. How's everything? Good. You're pretty cheerful this morning, aren't you? No, why not? Getting close to Christmas, the day of good cheer. Uh, what's the matter with you? Humboldt. Uh oh, the boss on a rampage again, huh? What is it this time? You haven't heard? No. What? Somebody lifted another 200 bucks out of the receipts last night. What? Again? Yeah. That makes about two grand that's been missing in the last couple of months. Well, no wonder Mr. Humboldt's upset. Mm -hmm. There's a detective in there with him right now. They got old Gus, the night watchman, in for questions. I suppose we'll all be on the carpet like the last time. Hmm. It's, it's not good, $2,000. Yeah. The 
cops are probably getting pretty sore about not pinning it on somebody. Oh, look, here comes old Gus, fresh from the Inquisition. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Humboldt. Gus, hey, hey, Gus. Yeah, Mr. Humboldt. Are they playing questions and answers in there again, Gus? Golly, uh, where was you this time? Where was you that time? The only time I got to sleep, they called me down here with this. What for would I want to steal money for? I got a wife, fine wife, four kids. I steal money, I go to jail. They starve. What for would I steal? Yeah, sure, Gus. They just have to ask questions, that's all. Uh, I don't know. I only know I didn't steal. This is the only time I got to sleep, and they have to go asking me questions. <laughs> what a character. Some night watchman for you. They seem pretty sure the thief is somebody inside the store, don't they? It would almost have to be, Mike. Uh-uh, it's Humboldt. Yes, Mr. Humboldt. Why, yes, right away. Huh? Just as I thought, it's my turn now. If I start screaming, you'll know he's putting me on the rack. Okay. I'll bring a branding iron to your rescue, huh? Hey, don't you laugh yet. You'll probably be next. If Humboldt really does decide to catch a thief, he'll catch one by hook or crook. It's strange, isn't it, Mike? Your Christmas spirit of only a few moments ago seems oddly dampened by something you can't describe. Can't even put your finger on. Just a peculiar sinking feeling. But you try to forget it as almost the whole day goes by and nothing further happens. George Osborne goes in and out of Humboldt's office but says very little afterwards, and everything seems to calm down. George even finds reason to display some Christmas spirit himself. And I really didn't expect it this year, Mike, but there it was in my pay envelope, nice and crisp and green, with the best holiday wishes of the store. Yes, that's swell, George. Yeah, real honest-to-gosh Christmas bonus. I can sure you... Oh, who couldn't? Well, I don't know whether you'll get one or not, Mike. You've only been here six months, but uh, maybe... Uh... Hey, by the way, why don't you uh, mosey in and pick up your pay? It's not too long till closing time. Oh, no, I'll, I'll wait. I'd like to pick up Elaine's present if I can get time. Oh, well, don't worry about that. Most of the stores will still be open for a couple of hours. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, I wanted to get her something she liked real well in those store up on 10th Avenue. It'll be open till late. I wonder if they found out anything about that uh, two grand. Boy, they've really questioned everybody around, though. You know, they didn't question me. Huh? In fact, they never questioned me about it. I... I... Don't quite understand that. Don't. I mean, you've got such an honest face or something. Yeah. Uh-oh. Yes, Mr. Humboldt. Oh, uh, uh, yes, sir. I'll send him right in. Well, maybe we uh, spoke too soon. He wants to see you. Oh? Uh -huh. On the other hand, maybe he just wants to hand you your Christmas bonus in person. You know, you're getting to be the fair-haired boy around here. Yes, sir. Uh, I better go in, huh? You might even be in line for a promotion. You can't tell. Okay, okay. You want to see me, Mr. Humboldt? Oh, yes, uh, Cobb. <clears throat> yes, uh, sit down. Thank you. Now, Cobb, you've been with us uh, six months now. Yes, sir. And I must admit that in that time, you've demonstrated an admirable aptitude for the work. Oh, thanks, yes, Mr. Humboldt. Yes, in fact, there has been some discussion of raising your salary and uh, promoting you. I even talked to Mr. Prentice, the manager, about it myself. Well, thanks, Mr. Humboldt. Uh, yes, and uh, that's why I regret very much to tell you this. I must inform you that uh, we are forced to dispense with your services as of tonight. You mean uh, I'm, I'm fired? Well, I'm afraid that's it. Uh, yes. yes. Your uh, two weeks' pay is in this envelope. Wait. Wait a minute. If I've been so good, why am I being fired? No, I'd rather not discuss that just now, Cobb. Uh, perhaps later on, uh, after the holiday. It's got something to do with that missing money, hasn't it? I told it's you. The store's I... way of saying they think I took it because I'm an ex-convict, isn't now, it? Now, Cobb. All right. I understand. I understand a lot of things now, Mr. Humboldt. Thanks. Thanks for the Christmas bonus. Hey! Hey, Mike, wait a minute! Did you get it? Did he give you a Christmas bonus? Yeah. Yeah, I got a Christmas bonus, all right. What's up? What's the matter? He's got fired for Christmas, that's all. What? I'll tell you about it later. I'm leaving now. Gee, that's tough. Uh, hey, wait, I almost forgot. With, with my bonus, I can pay you that 30 bucks I borrowed from you here. That ought to help with that present for your wife, huh? Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks, George, thanks. It's a terrible shock, isn't it, Mike? Your worry of this morning, this sinking feeling. 
The premonition was right, wasn't it? And now, walking towards home, you feel lost, alone in the gay holiday crowd. And almost without knowing you've done it, you enter a telephone booth, drop the coin, and call home. Elaine. Hello? Hello? Elaine? Mike, what is it? Did you get off early? No. No, Elaine, I, I didn't get off early. Mike, is something wrong? I got fired, Elaine. They kicked me out. Why? Why aren't you going to ask me why, or do you already know? Don't think about anything. Just come home. It's going to be all right. I, I took some money, Elaine. I, I might as well have. They believe it. I might as well be really guilty. Mike, what are you thinking? What are you going to do? I, I'm not sure, Elaine. I just said I might as well be guilty, that's all. If I was, I'd have a lot more than I've got. Mike, please, come home. I'll see you, Elaine. It won't be long. <laughs> your job, your marriage to Elaine. And then all of a sudden it was changed, wasn't it? Wiped away because of a series of thefts at the store where you worked. Your prison record went against you, didn't it? And you were dismissed without reason. And that's why there's no Christmas spirit in your heart now. Why the decorations, the crowds, the Christmas carols being sung by the usual seasonal carolers mean nothing. You've one thing in mind now, haven't you? Yes, you might as well be really guilty. That's why you've decided that you're going back to the store and take your share of the day's receipts or something equally valuable. It'll be simple, won't it, Mike? It'll soon be closing time. You can get in before the store closes and hide. And there's only old Gus, the watchman, to avoid. And you know his habits. Know, too, that the receipts will be in Mr. Humboldt's office in bags to be picked up by the armored car at midnight. You also know exactly where to pick up some highly valuable mink stoles, as well as some highly valuable jewelry, in case you can't get to the cash. You recall the addresses of two men whose names were given you in prison, men who pay cash and ask no questions regarding such items. You start back in the direction of the store. Realize you're on 10th Avenue, near old Mr. Samuel's tiny shop. The place where you were going to buy Elaine her present. And that's what you hear, isn't it, Mike? The music box on the counter, just inside the store. Well, good evening, Michael. Hi, Mr. Samuels. And what can I do for you? Uh, is this the music box Elaine likes so well? Ah, yes, that's the one. She was very taken with it. How her eyes sparkled when she looked at it. Yeah. Uh, there's a powder puff or something inside, isn't it? That's right. And when you open it, it plays a little tune. So. She was saying how it was her favorite tune. Yes. Okay. Uh, how much is it? Well, it's, uh, it's usually priced at $75. But I'll give it to you and the young lady for 50 Beautiful. Fifty dollars? Uh, well, yes. You see, it's a genuine antique and <laughs> the best thing I have in the store. I'm sorry. That's more than I figured. Oh, well, I'm sorry, too. I'd let you have it for less if I could, but fifty is the lowest. Yeah, I... sure. Okay. I get it. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, come back again. <laughs> you don't get very far away, do you, Mike? No, even though you've made up your mind that you have things to do, that you must get to the department store before closing time, you're still thinking about the music box, aren't you? Yes. You turn, walk back to Mr. Samuel's little shop. Yes? 
Oh, you've come back for the music box, my dear. Yeah, look, wrap it up, Mr. Samuels, uh, as a gift. I'll do it myself. I uh, thought you'd be back. Yeah, well, she'll like it. Uh, you've uh, something else on your mind, haven't you, Michael? Yeah, maybe. I don't mean to intrude on your thoughts, but, uh, well, you look troubled. Something go wrong? Uh, nothing I can't fix, Mr. Samuels. Look, is, is that clock right? Right on the dot. Well, well, hurry that up, will you? I gotta get to another store before closing time. It's almost ready, my girl. Here's the money. I got it. 20, 30, 40. Another 10 makes 50. I wish I could have made it even less, Michael. You understand. Yeah, sure, it's all right. Anyway, what's 50 bucks? That's right, isn't it, Mike? Fifty dollars means little when you'll soon have some of the day's receipts from the store. Or at least jewelry or furs of equal value. You hurry out of Mr. Samuel's shop. Take a cab to the store. You're inside and mingling with the crowd as the closing bell sounds. Morning. By the time the last of the crowd has disappeared... You're in the employee's locker room, hiding behind some discarded packing Good cases. Good night. The voices of the last employees to leave drift past. Well, good night, Mac. Merry Christmas, boy. <laughs> Same to you, Eddie, and best of the missus. Thanks, thanks. All right, this time of year, what else is there but a guy's home and family? Nothing else counts at all. <laughs> Those last words hit you, don't they, Mike? What else is there but a guy's home and family? Nothing else matters. Suddenly, you believe it again. You realize that going straight, keeping faith with Elaine means more to you than anything in the world. You wonder why you ever came here. You slip out of the locker room, hurry towards the front door, but it's too late. Old Gus is locked up. You duck down behind a counter, realizing that if he sees you now, there'll be no way to explain. Draw in your breath. Ease around the counter as Gus goes padding slowly past, almost within touching distance. Uh -huh. Coming, coming. Hold your horses. Stores all closed up, mister. I can't let anybody... Oh, a batch, huh? I'm Lieutenant Driscoll. Everything all right in here? No, what would be wrong? I'm looking for one of the store employees. A young fellow named Mike Cobb. Mike Cobb? Have you seen him? Why, no. Store's empty, Lieutenant. Everybody's gone home. Anyway, Mike Cobb was fired today. Yeah, I know about that. That's why we thought he just might have been here. No, not a sign of him, Lieutenant. Well, okay. Sorry to bother you. Good night. I'll let you out again, Lieutenant. What's that? Music box, I guess. Only, wait a minute. What's the matter? There's no music boxes on this floor. Huh? We better look into this, Lieutenant. You shake the music box, trying to make it stop, don't you, Mike? But it won't. And as Gus and the police lieutenant start toward you, you're forced to duck swiftly back around the counter. But the music box in your hand is leading them to you, isn't it? The end of the counter, you straighten up and make a dash for the stairs to the next Lieutenant. floor. There's somebody in this hall. Stop. Come on, guys. We'll get him. You're trapped, aren't you, Mike? And you feel like hurling the music box back at them. But suddenly it stops. Only the sound of your own running feet now. You duck into a storeroom on the second floor and, and wait. Uh, which way you go, Lieutenant? I, I don't know. Maybe up the next floor. Yeah. Be a little quiet of you. It's almost as if they can hear your heart pounding, isn't it, Mike? And the infuriating part of it all is the knowledge that you're running, hiding from something of which you're perfectly innocent. They won't believe you, will they? You've got to get away. And then... It starts again. And you wish you'd obeyed your hunch to throw it as far as you could. You hear that, Gus? Sure do. Coming from that storeroom there. Uh-huh. All right, you. Come on out with your hands up. Come on. Okay. What's the use? Mike. 
my car. All right, young fella, come on out. You can put away the gun. Oh, sure, sure, Lieutenant. It's my car. He's a fine boy, no matter what they say. All right, Mike, you're a fine boy. But suppose you start explaining just what you're doing hiding in the store. I explain. You won't believe me. I came here to steal some jewelry and furs, but before I did it, I changed my mind. Well, music box stopped, didn't it, Mike? Yeah. It stopped a little too late to do me any good. <laughs> certain of it is the police lieutenant and old Gus, the night watchman, stare at you. You know they'll never believe you when you tell how you entered the store and then changed your mind about the robbery, made your own decision to stay straight. You know now that it was only anger and bitterness that made you entertain the thought of stealing in the first place. But now you're sure your decision was in vain, that they'll be positive you not only were in the store with the intention of robbing it, but that you were also the man responsible for the series of thefts which led to your dismissal. Nevertheless, you find yourself spilling out your story, just as it happened, right up to the dread moment when the music box, your gift for Elaine, went off by accident, betraying your hiding place. That's the way it was, Lieutenant. I guess you're pretty unhappy about that music box, huh, Cobb? Oh, skip it. I've been unhappy all afternoon. I... I don't expect you to believe me. Well, there's one person that will. Yeah? Who? Your wife. See, she put us on your trail. Elaine? Mm-hmm. She didn't like the way you sounded on the telephone. You mean she called headquarters? Yeah, twice. Seems she got a call from uh, Mr. Samuels. He was worried about you, too. Hmm. Yeah, so I got a lot of friends. I think so. Maybe you'll see what I mean if you'll answer a few questions for us. I'll answer one. I didn't steal any of that money. I had nothing to do with it. We know that. But tell us this. When you bought that music box at Mr. Samuel's shop, you paid for it with a 20 and three tens, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, part of that money was marked. It was money that had been stolen from this department store. I tell you, I didn't steal it. That was money I got in my pay envelope. I earned it. Didn't somebody else give you part of it? Didn't somebody pay you debt? That's what we were told. Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, George Osborne. He paid me $30. He owed me. That's what we thought. Now, how did Osborne pay you? What uh, denomination of bill? Let me see. He gave me three tens. You sure? Yeah, absolutely. You got the 20 in your own pay envelope? Yeah, yeah. You'll swear to that in court? Of course. That does it. Thanks, Cobb. What? You mean... That's all you want from me? That's all. We've been sure it was Osborne, but we wanted to clinch it. Oh, incidentally, you weren't actually fired from the store, but uh, Mr. Humboldt wanted everyone to think so, especially Osborne. Your boss wouldn't fire anyone without a fair hearing. Well, why didn't... He... Well, he wanted you to think you were fired, too. Figuring if you got mad enough, it'd throw the real thief, Osborne, off guard. It worked, too. Yeah. It almost didn't. Well, I don't think you have to worry. 